There are some people online who will say they can give you the science without the gobbledygook. Science with no hype, no spin, and no tiptoeing around inconvenient truths. But is it really so easy to be neutral and unbiased when communicating science? And what does this have to do with transgender teenagers and particle physics? That's what we'll talk about today. Hi everyone. So a few weeks ago, science communicator and physicist Sabina Hassenfelder uploaded a video called "Is Being Transgender a Fad Among Teenagers?" And I found this video very frustrating. So frustrating that I've decided to make this video as a response to it because I feel a lot of what Sabina said in that video was misleading. Now, if I'm being fair, Sabina does get a number of things right in her video. Gender refers to our internal sense of being female, male, or something else. When someone's perceived gender doesn't align with their biological sex, we've come to call them transgender. Some of them are distressed by this experience and develop what's called gender dysphoria. Records of transgender people date back thousands of years. Several cultures, for example in India and Thailand, have communities of a third neutral gender. Then look at hormone therapy that replaces the hormones of the assigned gender with that of the chosen gender. In the abstract, they claim they found an increase in reported appearance congruence, that is, how well the participants felt their gender aligned with their appearance, positive effect, and life satisfaction. They also found a decrease of depression and anxiety symptoms. So Sabina acknowledges that transgender people have existed for millennia across many cultures, that they can suffer from uncomfortable feelings called gender dysphoria, and says that kids and teens can benefit from modern medical treatments like puberty blockers and hormone therapy. And it's nice to hear a science communicator acknowledge that when some people try to claim otherwise. However, my problem is with Sabina's overall conclusions. Firstly, she says this. Evidence that those children would benefit from puberty blockers or hormone therapy is slim, with large uncertainties. So Sabina is saying that the evidence for puberty blockers and hormone therapy helping trans kids and teenagers is limited. A second conclusion she draws is this. But the reasonable expectation is that the current increase in reports of gender dysphoria is caused by a mixture of two causes. Young people are more comfortable being openly trans and some of them erroneously believe they are trans because they've heard so much about it. I'd say that anyone who insists that one of those possibilities doesn't exist is pushing an agenda and shouldn't be taken seriously. So Sabina is basically saying that there are two reasons reasons why the rates of gender dysphoria are increasing. On one hand, transgender people are feeling more comfortable being openly trans as public opinion on trans people improves. But on the other hand, social media is probably playing a role in increasing the number of children and teens who think they are trans, when in reality, they're not. She says both sides have valid points, and anyone who ignores one side is pushing an agenda. Now, I'm going to tell you that neither of these conclusions is accurate. In fact, the evidence is overwhelmingly in favor of one side on both of these issues. Now, you might be getting ready to close this video. After all, Sabina warned you about dishonest people like me, right? People who are trying to push their political agendas. Well, if the evidence favored both sides equally, and I was trying to pull you over to my side, I would agree, that would be dishonest. But if the evidence clearly points to one side being correct, and someone is trying to drag you towards the middle, then it is they who are being dishonest, or at least biased. And I want to show you that this is indeed the case with Sabina. Now, the reason I'm making this video is partly because trans people are frequently misunderstood, and the rest of us should do our best to be reasonably informed about their lives and the medical care that they get. But also, although trans people make up a very small portion of the population, they are often used to strike up fear and anger to sway people's political opinions and voting choices. Over the past year or so in the US, multiple states have passed laws banning puberty blockers and cross-sex hormone treatments for minors under the age of 18. Florida in particular has passed multiple laws targeting trans people, 
This includes one law that allows the state to take a child away from their parents if the child is given puberty blockers or cross-sex hormones for gender-affirming purposes. Although this law is being challenged at the time of recording this video. This is all being done in the name of protecting children. But is that really true? If you're not careful online, it can be really easy to be dragged down a rabbit hole of misinformation, and I feel that being well informed on trans issues is important if these controversies are likely to impact your political views. So with this video, I'm not trying to cancel anyone or make people feel stupid, I'm just trying to get people back on track after having watched a video I think is misleading. So let's start by looking at the first issue, on the effectiveness of gender-affirming care for transgender kids and teenagers. And by gender-affirming care, I mean puberty blockers and hormone replacement therapy. Again, this is what Sabina has to say on it. Evidence that those children would benefit from puberty blockers or hormone therapy is slim, with large uncertainties. So basically, Sabina argues that gender-affirming care can help some kids and teens, but overall, evidence for positive effects is pretty slim. And this just isn't true. Some other YouTubers have already brought up a number of papers that support gender-affirming care for kids and teenagers, which I've linked in the description. I'm largely going to repeat their points, but I think they deserve to be repeated. So let's take a look at some papers that Sabina didn't bring up in her video. This 2021 paper by Green involves an online survey containing about 12,000 trans and non-binary youth, aged 13 to 24, and compared youth who were taking gender-affirming hormone therapy against those who weren't. And they found that those who were using gender-affirming hormone treatment had lower rates of depression and suicidality. The online survey also verified unique IP addresses to guard against spam responses. Now, one confounding factor here is that people with easy access to hormone treatment might just be richer, and therefore they might be happier because they have more money. But the survey takes socioeconomic status, as well as other demographic factors, into account, and they found the same conclusion across all groups. This 2020 paper by Turbin gathered data from around 20,000 transgender adults in the U.S., aged 18 to 36. They compared 3,405 of them who at some point wanted to take puberty blockers but couldn't take them against 89 who did take puberty blockers. They found that taking puberty blockers was associated with lower odds of lifetime suicide ideation when compared to those who wanted puberty blockers but did not take them. Again, they also found no significant differences in their results due to socioeconomic status or other demographic factors like age, gender, and sexual orientation. Vandermeisen 2020 studied adolescents from a gender identity clinic in Amsterdam. 272 of these adolescents did not yet receive gender-affirming care, whereas 178 of these adolescents did receive care in the form of puberty blockers. This was also compared with 651 cisgender high school students from the general population. In case you don't know, cisgender just means not transgender. The study concluded that, while adolescents referred for gender-affirming care have increased behavioral and emotional problems and report increased self-harm and suicidality, those who did receive gender-affirming care involving puberty blockers after referral had lower rates of all of these approaching the rates of their cisgender peers. COSTA 2015 did a longitudinal study of 201 gender-diverse adolescents referred to the Gender Identity Development Service in London. The study checked in on participants at 0, 6, 12, and 18 months since referral. It found that a combination of therapy and puberty blockers resulted in higher psychosocial functioning than therapy alone. So this study shows that there's a specific benefit to puberty blockers that therapy alone doesn't provide. This contradicts what Sabina suggests in her video about puberty blockers having possibly no effect. So the benefit might have come simply from receiving a treatment and being cared for. DeVry 2014 tracked 55 transgender people over several years, starting in adolescence, and checked in on them before receiving puberty blockers when they received cross-sex hormones 
and at least one year after gender reassignment surgery, which happened during adulthood. It concluded that gender dysphoria was alleviated and psychological functioning was improved among participants. This paper has no control group, but it does show the participants involved are happy with the standard gender-affirming care routine. And I've linked all of these papers in the description. And again, Sabina does not mention any of these papers. She mentions one paper, Tardoff 2022, that showed mental health improvement among a sample of 104 youth taking puberty blockers, cross-sex hormones, or both. But even here, she seems strangely hesitant to admit that gender-affirming care works. The mental health of those who were treated did not improve. What happened instead is that the mental health of those who were not treated got worse. It's weird that she's framing a lack of mental deterioration as if it's a bad thing, when that's exactly what puberty blockers are for. They prevent negative mental health symptoms in youth while they make up their minds or wait for other treatments. Puberty blockers are used to prevent the dysphoria from getting worse and also to give the children time to make up their mind. And as others have pointed out, Sabina criticizes this study for only having a control group of seven who did not get gender-affirming care at the end of the 12-month study, but she fails to mention the three-month and six-month follow-up surveys that have larger control groups, where the control groups had rates of depression and suicidality two to three times higher than the group who did receive gender-affirming care. So, to sum up, there is in fact a lot of evidence showing that puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones are beneficial to the youth who are taking them. But Sabina doesn't get this across to her audience and just kind of downplays it. Now, the second debate going on here involves rapid onset gender dysphoria, or ROGD, which is the hypothesis that children and teens are starting to falsely believe that they are transgender due to things they see on social media. Supposedly, this effect is contagious and spreading as a so-called social contagion. As Sabina mentions, the rapid onset gender dysphoria hypothesis was proposed by Lisa Littman in a 2018 paper. And right off the bat, I'll say this paper has a lot of problems. And that's not just my opinion. The original 2018 paper was heavily criticized in the medical community to the point where it was reviewed by the journal's senior editors who demanded that corrections be made and sections of the paper be rewritten. I've linked the original paper from 2018, the 2019 correction, and the 2019 correction notice in the description if you want to compare them. One noteworthy change in the 2019 corrected version is the paper stating outright that it's merely generating a hypothesis, and it doesn't actually validate the hypothesis, so the paper doesn't prove anything. Another change in the corrected 2019 version is the paper clearly stating that it got information from websites with cautious or negative views of transgender healthcare for teenagers. So the paper is about a survey of 256 parents that were recruited from three websites with these cautious or negative views of transgender healthcare for teens. Fourthwavenow.com, youthtranscriticalprofessionals.org, which refers to the gender critical movement which rejects the concept of gender identity, and transgendertrend.com. That last one is the one I showed at the beginning of the video, which says no child is born in the wrong body. So as you can see, these are very biased websites. Over three quarters of the parents surveyed did not believe their child was trans, and only six did believe their child was trans. So right off the bat, a large portion of parents surveyed are going to be looking for alternative reasons why their children came to believe they are transgender. So the really obvious drawback with this paper is that parents, even good ones, can have limited knowledge of what's going on in their children's lives. In a Pew Research study of about 1,200 LGBT Americans, over one-third of them had not come out to one or both of their parents about it. See, a pretty common pattern among LGBT people is that they will go through a period where they're unsure what their identity is. Then they figure out their identity for sure, and then later finally tell someone about it. And the time between these stages can be months or years. 
Also, not everyone figures out their identity as a kid or a teenager. Personally, I'm a bisexual man, and I didn't start questioning that my orientation might not be straight until my early 20s. And some people can figure it out later as well. So, getting information from parents on extremely biased websites and refusing to talk to any actual trans people isn't likely to give you that much useful information. The paper claims that the trans teenagers displayed few or none of the symptoms of gender dysphoria as children, with parents describing the gender dysphoria as having come out of the blue. But again, this is just according to the parents. This isn't an official diagnosis. The children may have indeed felt feelings of gender dysphoria and just never told anyone about it. Or they could have hidden the feelings of wanting to be the other gender because they thought it was wrong. Or, if they didn't know that the concept of transgender people existed, they might not have had the language to express how they felt. Also, it's not really that surprising that some transgender children might start questioning their gender identity slightly before or during puberty. It's true that puberty can be a confusing and uncomfortable time for all teenagers, both cisgender and transgender, but transgender teenagers tend to experience puberty in a different way. The DSM-5 criteria used to identify gender dysphoria in children is different than the criteria used to identify gender dysphoria in teenagers and adults. Many of the criteria for teens and adults reference physical traits that appear during puberty, which are also called secondary sex characteristics, like body hair, breast, changes in voice, or general changes in body shape. And it's not just the presence of these traits that can contribute to gender dysphoria, it's also the desire to have traits that are not normally associated with that person's birth sex. So it's not that surprising that a child who hadn't worried too much about their gender before might start questioning if they are trans as they approach or enter puberty. This is a time when trans people often feel anxiety about body changes that are hard or impossible to reverse and feel a desire for physical traits that will never develop without medical treatment. Another problem here is that the paper makes a lot of dubious connections between correlation and causation. You've probably heard the phrase, correlation does not equal causation. Basically, just because two things tend to happen at the same time, doesn't mean the first definitely causes the second. For example, if you notice the windmill spinning every time the wind blows, it doesn't mean that windmills cause the wind. Similarly, rain and umbrellas appearing together doesn't mean that umbrellas cause the rain. Now, you might think that these examples are silly, but in medicine, it can actually be pretty difficult to determine what's correlation and what's causation. For example, if you notice that cancer patients tend to have low cholesterol, does that mean low cholesterol increases the risk of cancer, or does it just mean that cancer causes low cholesterol as a symptom? Or could there be something else causing both of them? And Sabina actually makes a mistake involving correlation and causation in her video. In 2016, the American Food and Drug Administration ordered makers of puberty blockers to add a warning about mental health problems to the drug's label after they received several reports of suicidal thoughts in children who were taking them. Here, Sabina is sort of implying that puberty blockers can lead to suicidal thoughts in kids and teens. But she's ignoring the fact that transgender kids and teens already have elevated levels of suicidal thoughts to begin with. So that's not good evidence that puberty blockers are the cause of suicidal thoughts. Also, this FDA warning on puberty blockers was based on reports from only 10 individuals. And there's no mention of a control group for determining if the negative emotional effects were due to the puberty blockers specifically, or if they were just a baseline for children experiencing gender dysphoria. Despite Sabina stressing the importance of control groups throughout the rest of her video, she doesn't mention control groups here. And as I've already shown, studies that did use control groups show the opposite, that puberty blockers decrease suicidal thoughts good reminder that correlation is not causation. Lisa Littman's paper on rapid onset gender dysphoria is full of this kind of bad reasoning with correlation and causation. For example, she points out that parents claim their children have increased levels of internet usage prior to coming out as transgender, 
and that this could be evidence that rapid onset gender dysphoria is spreading online like a contagious disease. But it could also just mean that a teenager is questioning their gender identity and is too nervous to talk about it to anyone in real life. And so they tell people online instead because it's a lower risk environment. If they regret anything they say online, they can just delete their posts or account and forget about it. This is a pretty common thing for LGBT people. In fact, many news sources reported on a study from Tinder, which said that 75% of their Gen Z LGBT users came out online first before coming out to someone in real life. And this isn't even unique to LGBT people. Tons of people who have problems they aren't comfortable discussing in real life will often make posts online asking for help or advice for the same reason. Another bad example of thinking correlation equals causation is Littman noting that parents report their teenagers being in friend groups where many individuals came out as trans around the same time. So again, does this mean that being transgender is spreading like a contagious disease? Well, it could just mean that trans teens enjoy being friends with other trans teens because they have something in common. Or it could be because trans teens are getting bullied by their cisgender peers and feel that being friends with trans people is their only option. Either way, they could be choosing to keep their trans identities a secret from their parents until they feel comfortable coming out. When the teen does come out, it might appear to a parent with limited information that all the teens in the friend group decided they were trans in a short time frame. Again, this is not a very compelling argument for requiring a new contagion-based model of trans identity. The mixing up of correlation and causation can also get pretty uncomfortable in the paper. This part involves sexual assault, so you can skip ahead if you don't want to hear about it. Quoting from the paper, A natal female was traumatized by rape when she was 16 years of age. Before the rape, she was described as a happy girl. After the rape, she became withdrawn and fearful. Several months after the rape, she announced that she was transgender and told her parents that she needed to transition. End quote. And it's just really unclear why the paper puts these two sentences together and implies there's a connection between these two events. Why would you think that these two things are related? To be fair, Sabina does mention some of these criticisms about how the parents were recruited from biased websites in her video. But she kind of takes it all in stride, and by the end of the video, she still thinks it's pretty likely that the internet is tricking certain teens into thinking they're trans. Young people are more comfortable being openly trans, and some of them erroneously believe they are trans because they've heard so much about it. I'd say that anyone who insists that one of those possibilities doesn't exist is pushing an agenda and shouldn't be taken seriously. Now, I'd like to contrast this with how Sabina treats hypothetical particles in particle physics. See, over the last few decades, a number of particle physicists have proposed hypothetical particles to solve various physical or mathematical problems. But the vast majority of these particles haven't turned up in experiments. The Higgs boson proposed in the 1960s and discovered in 2012 is the exception, not the rule. There's about as much evidence for any of those as for Bigfoot, though Bigfoot would probably have got me more views. They are not scientific hypotheses. They are made up stories, like my friend, the Prince of Nigeria, who'd send you money tomorrow. So Sabina clearly has no time for all these unfounded hypotheses on new particles. But when it comes to the rapid onset gender dysphoria hypothesis, which is on extremely shaky ground, the skeptical Sabina we know from particle physics is pretty much nowhere to be found. Like, given how dubious Littman's paper is, it's hard to understand why we should be even taking it seriously. The last thing I'll mention is, Littman's paper says a lot of the parents surveyed were experiencing conflicts with their teenagers. The corrected version of the paper includes an extremely obvious hypothesis. Maybe there is no trans social contagion and the teens are indeed transgender, but the parents just don't believe them, and the teens are upset about that. Now, this combination of parents having limited information and making dubious claims about correlation and causation is not a good basis for science. And this can have disastrous results when taken seriously. In fact, we've already seen such a disaster play out before already with the pseudoscientific belief that vaccines cause autism.
Measles, mumps, and rubella are very contagious diseases that almost every child used to get before adulthood. They have a number of unpleasant symptoms, and in some rare cases, they can cause brain damage or even death. So when the vaccines were invented in the 1960s, it made sense to try and vaccinate kids when they are pretty young. So a first dose of the MMR vaccine is typically done at around 12 to 15 months of age. By pure coincidence, this is around the same time that various autistic traits can be identified in autistic children. So mathematically speaking, a toddler getting the MMR vaccine and an autistic toddler starting to display autistic traits are correlated. They tend to happen around the same time. But that doesn't mean vaccines cause autism. That claim has absolutely no scientific basis. The two are unrelated, aside from the fact that they coincidentally happen around the same age. But that didn't stop a now-discredited doctor named Andrew Wakefield from trying to suggest that vaccines cause autism in a 1998 paper. Wakefield proposed that the MMR vaccine caused a bowel disease linked to autism in children, although no one else was ever able to reproduce his findings. And later, it turned out that he falsified his results. Wakefield explains in his paper that eight parents out of a group of 12 believed their child's autism was caused by the MMR vaccine. He displays this in a table with a column titled Exposure Identified by Parents or Doctors, so you can't tell if a parent or a doctor said it. We've already discussed how this jump from correlation to causation is bad science. But this bad reasoning also relies on parents having limited information. It's possible that a child could have been displaying autistic traits before they got vaccinated, but the parents just didn't notice it. But when doctors pointed out Wakefield's bad science, it barely mattered, because the media took the vaccines might cause autism story and ran with it. Simply reach their son, who they've lost to autism. Bern Grant Hume say this home video of their son shows a bubbly toddler developing normally. Within two weeks of the MMR injection, he, he had such a profound change of his... Recently we saw a television news report about um, something that really stuck in my mind, which was the link between the MMR vaccine and autism. But, uh, the history of vaccinations have shown a lot of benefits. It's important for science to take note of the increased reporting with respect to rates of autism in recent years. Uh, if we have a, in, a higher incidence of autism, this is an appropriate subject for a congressional inquiry. And it's hard not to notice the parallels between Wakefield's paper on vaccines causing autism and Littman's paper on rapid onset gender dysphoria. Littman's paper is just a collection of biased parents' opinions about their children's gender identity. And the author tries to suggest that internet usage, friend groups, and traumatic events like sexual assault are somehow the cause of teenagers identifying as transgender based on really tenuous correlations and no scientific proof. And despite the multiple criticisms of Littman's paper, the media ran with this story too. After doing the study with 256 parents, what was your conclusion? Social influence could be possible, but also these clusters, they describe these friend groups where 50% or more of the friend group became transgender identified. Nor do we want to celebrate something that may not be real. Lisa Lippman began studying the sudden spike in trans identification of teenage girls. She concluded that peer influence and social media influence had a lot to do with this trans teen phenomenon. Explain rapid onset gender dysphoria. And then usually what happens is there's some sort of... I don't know, educational session at school or one of these girls, their friends come out as trans and then the daughter says, oh, I, I want to be a boy. I think it's social contagion. An extra reward. Yeah. There's a reward in terms of the attention they get. Yeah. And wow. also I think... And this kind of reckless speculation is harmful to everyone. Even though Andrew Wakefield's paper was retracted and his medical license was revoked, the planet is still dealing with the fallout of the controversy he stirred up over 20 years ago. Measles outbreaks have since popped up all over the world because parents were scared of vaccines, including the US where measles was previously declared eradicated. And Wakefield still pushes his ideas at various anti-vaccine events. 
Likewise, treating someone's gender identity as a kind of contagious disease is not only scientifically inaccurate and demeaning to trans people, it also makes uninformed people scared about transgender medical care, causing them to fail to make the best medical decisions for their kids, or even for themselves. Actually, there's another parallel between vaccines and trans health care I'd like to bring up. Expenses for gender affirming care can exceed 100,000 US dollars even with insurance coverage. Okay, so some people are making a lot of money with this. Sabina brings up gender affirming surgery and hormones can get quite expensive over a person's lifetime, which is true. Granted, not all trans people desire to undergo all these surgeries, but some definitely do. However, some people take this fact of expensive health care and come to the conclusion that trans health care isn't necessary, that it's just a scam targeting vulnerable teens. Now, I want to be clear, Sabina does not suggest this in her video, but I know that there are people who do believe this line of reasoning. This is something that comes up with vaccines too. The logic goes that, because pharmaceutical companies are making lots of money on vaccines, vaccines must be a scam. I've already shown multiple studies showing the benefits of gender-affirming care for teenagers, but that aside, healthcare being expensive and making companies lots of money isn't unique to trans people. It's true all across the healthcare industry. The lifetime cost of insulin for someone with diabetes in the United States can range from tens to hundreds of thousands of dollars. This doesn't mean that insulin is just a placebo trick we use to scam money out of diabetics. If you think that these treatments are expensive, I'm sure a lot of diabetics and trans people would agree. But this doesn't mean that the treatments themselves are bad. And this is a bit of a recurring problem when discussing transgender people. Because trans issues are so controversial, people treat trans issues with a level of skepticism and scrutiny that they wouldn't normally apply to other similar cases. This is what I call special scrutiny. For example, there's a lot of media attention given to people who regret transitioning and choose to detransition. And they emphasize how risky transitioning is because it can lead to irreversible changes. While these cases of regret do happen, they are statistically unlikely. This Swedish study of 767 transition cases between 1960 and 2010 reported only a 2.2% regret rate among transitioners. This UK survey of people referred for gender-affirming care found that out of about 3,400 patients, only 16 of the patients' reports contained mention of transition-related regret or detransitioning. Ten of these cases of detransition were temporary. It's also important to note that not all detransitioners choose to detransition because of regretting the transition procedure itself. The 2015 transgender survey from the United States found that, of the 17,180 transitioners surveyed, 12.3% of them detransitioned for other reasons, like money issues, discrimination, or pressure from family or spouse. Now, it is true that teenagers who take cross-sex hormones for extended periods of time go through irreversible changes. But it's important to keep in mind that there's another type of possible regret here, the regret of not taking puberty blockers or hormones in a teenager, which is actually a lot more common. See, a so-called natural puberty also involves irreversible changes, and many trans people who live through a natural puberty can regret it for decades afterwards. Recall that study I mentioned where, out of the thousands of trans people who wanted to take puberty blockers, only 89 were actually able to. Now, I don't want to downplay the pain of people who transition and later regret it. Ideally, I'd like both of these types of regrets to be minimized. But if we strictly regulate puberty blockers and hormones in order to protect a small number of potential detransitioners, we're going to increase the number of people who regret not transitioning earlier in their lives before irreversible changes take place. Another example of special scrutiny is the concerns people have with children and teens taking puberty blockers for gender-affirming care, because puberty blockers can have side effects. There are children who are not transgender who take puberty blockers too, in particular those that suffer from hormone disorders like precocious puberty or early puberty. 
In fact, disorders like these are why puberty blockers were introduced in the first place. And basically no one complains about these children experiencing the side effects of puberty blockers, even though they do complain about it in the case of trans children. I might also bring up those recent laws in the United States which ban puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones used for gender-affirming care on minors under 18. These laws don't apply for non-gender-affirming purposes. You might also expect these laws to ban genital surgeries on minors under 18, but that's actually not true. Some of these laws specifically allow for male circumcisions and surgery on ambiguous intersex genitals to be performed on children. So the politicians who wrote these laws are in favor of irreversible surgeries on a child's genitals being done when the child is too young to consent. It just has to be the type of irreversible genital surgery on children that the politicians personally think is good and normal. And there's not much consideration given to what will happen if these children grow up and regret the surgeries done to them. In particular, an extremely high number of intersex people grow up to be upset that surgery was done on their genitals to make them more quote-unquote normal. So are these laws actually trying to protect children, or are they motivated by something else? A final example of special scrutiny that transgender people face is the increasing number of children and teens who identify as transgender, and the corresponding increase in the number of referrals for gender-affirming care in kids and teens. This is one of the facts at the center of the rapid-onset gender dysphoria controversy. But this could also just be due to trans people becoming more widely accepted in society, similar to the way left-handedness increased once people stopped forcing their children to use their right hand. Sabina also points this out in her video, but kind of just brushes this argument aside. Interracial relationships and same-sex relationships have also increased in popularity as public opinion on them grows more positive. Are these also social contagions? I mean, some people do believe that. Now, to be fair, the rate of increase of kids and teens being referred for gender-affirming care is greater than both of these previous examples. But you have to keep in mind that gender-affirming care for children was basically outside the realm of possibility for most children a few decades ago. Most 11-year-olds in the 90s or early 2000s probably didn't know what puberty blockers were and possibly didn't even know what transgender meant. So it's not unreasonable to believe that this increase in the number of gender-affirming care treatments for kids and teens is reflective of society being more aware of gender-affirming treatments, gender-affirming treatments being more widely available, and transgender people having improved public perception. I think it is very misguided to jump to conclusions and dismiss this as the result of popular trends and social contagions. In the 90s, concerns about the increased rates of autism diagnoses were exactly what fueled the scare that vaccines cause autism. And given how biased Lisa Littman's ROGD survey of parents is, it seems strange to jump to that conclusion as one of the only possible explanations. There's also specific concerns with how there has been an increase in the number of teenage girls who are starting to identify as boys. Sabina mentions this has been noted in several countries, However, she only provides source links for two of them. And I also had to subscribe to Sabina's Patreon to see these sources because she doesn't offer them for free. The paper from the Netherlands does note an increase in the number of female to male adolescents, but also notes that the percentage of gender dysphoria diagnoses remains roughly the same, and the percentage of diagnosed adolescents that started affirmative medical treatment also did not change over time. They say these findings suggest that the recently observed exponential increase in referrals might reflect that seeking help for gender dysphoria has become more common rather than adolescents being referred to gender identity services with lower intensities of gender dysphoria or more psychological difficulties. The paper from Spain she links to also mentions that 97.6% of the youth in the study continued to identify as transgender after a median follow-up time of 2.6 years, after they were initially surveyed. This paper from Sweden says that it has no evidence for the increased number of assigned female at birth gender dysphoria cases having lower degrees of gender dysphoria. It also suggests other possible reasons for the uneven gender ratio. 
For example, some of it could be explained by female puberty occurring earlier than male puberty, causing more intense gender dysphoria earlier on in those assigned female at birth. And while all trans people can experience bullying, the paper notes that there can be greater social costs for male to female transitioning. Basically, someone who initially presents as male, who starts wearing a dress and makeup, is going to be more visible than someone who initially presents as female who wears pants. So that could also explain the lower incidence of male to female cases in gender clinics. Again, there's this really big push to believe the social contagion is at work here, indicating that correlation must equal causation, even though there are simpler explanations for these statistics that are readily available. Also, as someone who has been in a same-sex relationship for almost nine years, I want to point out that the accusations of following popular trends or being contagious diseases have often been used against bisexual and gay people as well. I think this is something worth thinking about, especially since many people who believe in the rapid onset gender dysphoria hypothesis claim to support gay marriage. Anyway, I've gone off on a couple tangents, and I'd like to get back to Littman's rapid onset gender dysphoria paper. The 2019 corrected paper now clearly states that this exploratory study doesn't validate the ROGD hypothesis. But what about papers that came afterward? Did they prove anything? Well, this 2023 paper by Diaz claims it found 1,655 possible cases of rapid onset gender dysphoria. This was also reported in the media. So how did the paper find these new ROGD cases? Well, they did a survey of parents recruited from the website, parents of rapid onset gender dysphoria kids.com. Okay, so this has all the same problems as Littman's paper. Highly biased parents with limited information making dubious jumps from correlation to causation, and not talking to a single transgender person or providing actual proof. This paper also discusses how gender dysphoria in teens could be due to something called autogynephilia, which is an idea developed in the 1980s that has basically no evidence supporting it. Autogynephilia is the idea that someone who initially presents as male experiences sexual arousal at the idea of being female. So it basically tries to categorize some trans people as having a kind of cross-dressing fetish. Pretty much all research on trans people goes against autogynephilia as being a source of gender dysphoria, and the original paper on autogynephilia had no control group comparing trans women to cis women. So this is pretty scientifically dubious. Also, I just want to be clear about what's going on here. There are grown adults who found out that some teenagers they never met identified as transgender, and these adults decided to speculate, based on some parents' opinions, that the teenagers had a secret sexual fetish. And they decided to publish this speculation about the teenagers' secret sexual fetishes in an academic journal with no evidence for the whole world to see. Aside from being unscientific, it's just really, really gross. I also want to point out a pattern here. When someone who initially presents as male says they are transgender, this gets dismissed as them just being really horny. And when someone who initially presents as female says they are transgender, this gets dismissed as them being vulnerable and mentally ill. If you believe in these autogynephilia and social contagion hypotheses, I think you need to ask yourself, do you actually have good scientific evidence for these theories? Or are you just falling back on some sexist stereotypes that have been dressed up in academic language to make them seem more legitimate? Also, while I was editing this video, Diaz's paper was actually retracted on June 14th, because it didn't obtain proper informed consent from the people it surveyed. Okay, let's move on. Has anyone tried to use scientific methods to validate Littman's ROGD hypothesis? Well, this 2022 paper by Bauer et al. tried. The authors did some analysis of an existing dataset of transgender youth under the age of 16 from 10 Canadian medical clinics. They sorted the youth according to gender knowledge, which was defined as the number of years since they self-reported they realized their gender was different from what other people called them. Here's the distribution of gender knowledge among the youth in the study. For example, one year of gender knowledge could be a 13-year-old who realized their gender was different at age 12. 
and 11 years of gender knowledge could be a 15-year-old who realized their gender was different at age 4. The authors tried to look for differences between youth with recent gender knowledge compared to those who had more long-term gender knowledge. Comparisons were made along criteria listed in Littman's paper that are associated with rapid-onset gender dysphoria. Specifically, they looked for differences in terms of mental health, neurodevelopmental disability diagnoses, maladaptive coping behaviors like self-harm, support from online and or transgender friends but not parents, and lesser gender dysphoria. The study found that recent gender knowledge was not significantly associated with any of these, with the exception that youth with more recent gender knowledge had less anxiety, which is the opposite of what Littman claimed would be true in her paper. So according to this study, there's no evidence that rapid onset gender dysphoria exists. Now, Bauer's paper has received some criticism. One psychiatrist criticized the sample size of 173 for being too small. And you could argue that if you like, but I want to remind you that Littman's paper had a study size of zero, because it didn't do any studies to validate its own hypothesis. So if you're skeptical of Bauer's paper based on sample size, you should be significantly more skeptical of Littman's paper for that exact reason. This critic also calls Littman's original paper carefully considered research, and based on the fact that it had to be rewritten due to criticism, I don't think I can agree. Littman herself also criticized Bauer's study, saying that the recent gender knowledge approach to defining ROGD is novel and not the correct definition. Littman also criticizes the age range used in the study, which is pubescent and postpubescent youth under 16, because they don't relate to the timing of the onset of gender dysphoria with that of puberty, which is a really weird criticism. I mean, the whole idea is that ROGD is supposed to appear in pubescent and postpubescent teenagers. It's especially weird because Littman's survey involved youth from ages 11 to 27, with an average age of 16.4. So the youth in Littman's paper are, on average, older, making them farther away from puberty than the youth in Bauer's paper. So this criticism just comes off as incoherent. But this actually does raise an interesting question. If Bauer's paper didn't actually look for rapid-onset gender dysphoria using the correct criteria, then what criteria should we be using to look for it? Littman doesn't exactly say. And this is a pretty big problem. If we don't really know what we're looking for when it comes to rapid-onset gender dysphoria, how do we know if we've found it? Basically, what I'm asking is, is rapid-onset gender dysphoria falsifiable? I'd like to go back to some things that Sabina has said about all these hypothetical particles in particle physics. Pattern is this. Particle physicists invent particles, make predictions for those invented particles, and when these predictions are falsified, they change the model and make new predictions. They say it's good science because these hypotheses are falsifiable. So Sabina is complaining about how some particle physicists will propose particles with certain properties, but when experiments go to look for the particles and don't find anything, the particle physicists will update their hypotheses to say that the particles should be found with slightly different properties instead. And this can lead to a never-ending cycle of hypotheses that are slightly modified just enough to escape experimental detection, where the goalposts keep moving and we never find any experimental evidence. But what's to stop the same thing from happening with rapid-onset gender dysphoria? I mean, Bauer's paper is an example of a study that tried to find evidence of it by searching for differences in teenagers who started identifying as transgender more recently. But according to Littman, this isn't the correct way of doing things and we need to change the experiment. But she doesn't specify how. So if ROGD is so vaguely defined, how do we know when we've found it? Littman isn't exactly moving the goalposts here, it's more like she's hiding the goalposts. She's not telling us how we're supposed to prove ROGD actually exists. And if no one can actually prove or disprove ROGD, doesn't that make the hypothesis useless? I'd like to play one last clip of Sabina towards the end of her video on trans teenagers. 
young people are more comfortable being openly trans and some of them erroneously believe they are trans because they've heard so much about it. The question is, how do you tell these two possibilities apart? Sabina is in a bit of an awkward place here. She's pretty sure that there are two types of gender dysphoria, the standard kind and the rapid onset kind proposed by Littman. But Sabina doesn't actually know how to tell the difference between them. But if that's the case, why believe that there are two types in the first place? Ultimately, what are we even talking about with rapid onset gender dysphoria beyond some vague opinions from a group of biased parents? So let's sum everything up. The state of reality is this. There is good evidence across multiple studies that both puberty blockers and hormone treatments benefit transgender teenagers. And regret rates for these treatments are pretty low. But Sabina doesn't present it that way. She makes it seem like the effectiveness of these treatments is still up in the air. Evidence that those children would benefit from puberty blockers or hormone therapy is slim, with large uncertainties. Meanwhile, rapid onset gender dysphoria is little more than the opinions of a bunch of parents, and has no scientific studies supporting its existence. But Sabina keeps bringing it up as if it's something we need to take seriously. Young people are more comfortable being openly trans and some of them erroneously believe they are trans because they've heard so much about it. I'd say that anyone who insists that one of those possibilities doesn't exist is pushing an agenda and shouldn't be taken seriously. So what Sabina is doing here is she's taking actual well-supported science behind transgender healthcare and demoting it to the level of speculation. Meanwhile, she's taking the various speculations about rapid onset gender dysphoria and social contagions and elevating them to the level of something that needs to be taken seriously. And this is not an honest picture of reality. It's a glaring example of the middle ground fallacy, where you assume the truth must be in the middle between two sides, even if one side has well-supported evidence and the other does not. And this is why Sabina's video bothers me so much. There are actually a number of things that Sabina's video gets right and are factual, but the good stuff is mixed in with a lot of misleading framing about the levels of evidence we have for trans healthcare and for speculations about social contagions. She kind of takes for granted that there's a controversy here with two valid sides, without really questioning if that's true. This makes her entire video a bit of a mess, and very confusing for uninformed viewers. I think many people who watched Sabina's video are actually worse off at being informed on trans people than those who never watched it in the first place. Viewers got some truth, sure, but they were misled in a number of other areas at the same time. And having this misinformation in their brains will impact how they interpret all media on transgender issues moving forward, possibly making them take some ideas seriously when they have no factual basis to stand on. Now, I don't want to act as if all transgender issues are black and white. Although some trans kids know very early on that their gender identity doesn't match their body, for other trans people, the process of figuring out their gender identity can be confusing, and it might involve a number of conversations with their family, other trans people, and doctors in order to figure out what's best for them. These things are worth having conversations about, but these conversations require honesty, and Sabina's video doesn't give an honest picture of the facts. I'd like to offer special thanks to my transgender friend Jade for offering feedback on the first draft of this video.